so yeah, so this will be a little bit of a change in pace. It's supposed to be a pretty practical talk in trying to understand um, and be able to use the cardiology consultation note to help manage your patients. So I have no disclosures relevant to this talk, um, other than I'm really happy that I'm tall enough to see the screen in front of me, which is good. Um, just made it, I think. Um, so the objectives uh, for the next 15 minutes or so is to understand important principles in the management of ambulatory heart failure, be able to answer heart failure related questions from your patient, um, and be familiar with specific criteria that should prompt further review by the patient's cardiologist. Uh, so I'll start off with the case. This is pretty typical in the clinic uh, that I see, and I think you guys all have these kinds of patients. Uh, a little maybe a bit younger than, than, than the majority, but 65 year old female with an idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy and a recent heart failure and reduced ejection fraction diagnosis. Um, that was made during a hospitalization. During that hospitalization, she, she had a normal angiogram, um, and her echocardiogram demonstrated severe LV systolic dysfunction. Uh, she was seen once after her hospitalization by her cardiologist, who made some changes to her medical therapy. Um, in clinic, she looks well. She's functional class two to three. Uh, without PND, orthopnea, syncope, edema, or chest discomfort, she feels a lot better than she did when, before she went into the hospital. Um, her medications are as follows, pretty typical for a heart failure reduced ejection fraction patient. As mentioned, she was on quote unquote triple therapy with carvedilol 6.25 milligrams twice daily, spironolactone 25 milligrams daily, ramipril 2.5 milligrams twice a day. Uh, she was on furosemide 40 milligrams a day, and uh, she was also started on digoxin 0.125 milligrams daily. Her physical exam, pretty typical for a, uh, a woman with heart failure reduced ejection fraction with a blood pressure. A little bit soft at 82 over 46, a heart rate of 90 and regular. She appeared compensated without any uh, obvious uh, evidence of congestion uh, in, her, in the clinic visit today, and there were no murmurs or edema noted. So I don't know if your patients do this, and mine do this to me all the time. They show up with their notepad and they have questions, um, and I'm sure they do this to you guys as well. Um, and these are some of the questions that come up in your clinic visit. I read all that these all these medications are for lowering blood pressure, but I've been checking my blood pressure, and the top number is always in the 80s. Should I stop some of these medications? A very common question that comes up. Um, I was told not to eat any salt and drink as little fluid as possible. Do I need to keep doing that? Um, and I'm scared to exercise. What am I allowed to do? So. Um, you might be tempted, uh, you look back at the cardiology consultation and see these kind of vague recommendations, which is not that helpful to help answer these questions. You might be tempted to take that notepad with the questions and just fax it off to the cardiologist, um, which would probably be the most efficient way of doing it. I have to really figure out, I, th I think that's what a fax machine looks like, um, but we still use faxes too in our clinic too, I'm embarrassed to say. Okay, so, um, uh, so, We'll review a little bit of medical therapy and heart failure reduced ejection fraction, and I think uh, the question about antihypertensive effects of the medications is relevant, um, and the doses are also relevant, but so yes, all the medications we use in heart failure and reduced ejection fraction are also antihypertensives, but they're not used for that effect. Um, and one of the temptations that comes up in these clinic visits is to look at the blood pressure and, and think about lowering uh, the medications. Uh, but what we know in uh, the heart failure literature and uh, this actually is an interesting trial that was done, uh, that was published, I think, in the late, uh, late 90s, called the ATLAS trial, that actually looked at low versus high dose lisinopril in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction and the effect it had on morbidity and mortality. So this is a very brave study to do. This was not a placebo-controlled trial. This was not a new drug. This was testing a drug at one dose versus a drug at another dose. Um, and what they found was that in patients who were treated uh, with high-dose lisinopril, uh, in general, their outcomes were significantly better than those who were treated on low-dose lisinopril. So this gave rise to the notion, um, and all future heart failure trials have done this, have shown uh, that as you titrate, the, you, that all drugs need to be titrated to their target dose, but this is actually the landmark trial that proved that actually doing that improves outcomes. Um, now, in terms of uh, the evidence in beta blocker, we don't have the same kind of evidence, uh, but this was uh, published not too long ago. I've reversed the references, actually. This was the 2014 study that looked at outcomes in patients based on their heart rate and the titration of a beta blocker. And it's very clear that if, if you can get your patient's heart rate down, or at least if the patient's heart rate uh, goes down into the, into the high 50s or low 60s, 
their outcomes are significantly better than in patients whose heart rates remained in the 70s and 80s. Um, and this is, again, where uh, the whole notion of maximizing beta blocker uh, therapy comes from, and in those who you can't get their heart rate down using drugs like Irvabradine, this, this is the data that supports that strategy. So in general, uh, when my patients ask me, do I need to stay on all these drugs even though my blood pressure is low, if they're feeling okay, um, I always tell patients that in, in the heart failure world, a little bit of drug is good, uh, but more drug is better um, in terms of outcomes. So if you actually look at the guidelines, um, this, so this actually, this is just before the guidelines, this is just before, this is what the guidelines are based on, but if you actually look at how drugs were titrated in clinical trials, this first paragraph came from the protocol from the consensus trial, which is one of the first ACE inhibitor trials. You actually see that the drugs were titrated up, and they, they only stopped titrating the drugs uh, if the patients developed symptomatic hypotension. So not asymptomatic hypotension, but symptomatic hypotension. Um, and similar criteria were used in the uh, Paradigm trial, which is obviously one of the more contemporary trials in heart failure management, that again, uh, they were started at modest doses, but one of the reasons that they would not further titrate or dose de-escalate uh, was for symptomatic hypotension um, or some other clinical events. And so if you look at the guidelines, um, they're very clear that we recommend preferentially using specific drugs at, at target doses that have been proven to be beneficial in clinical trials um, as optimal medical therapy. Um, and the practical tip is that if symptomatic hypotension persists with goal-directed medical therapy, not only uh, do you have to wait for symptoms, but actually the first strategy if they become symptomatic is actually to separate the doses rather than de-escalate the dose or stop the drug. Um, and I think that's an important point to be made because we're all seeing these patients, um, and I think it's a big disservice to the patient if they get removed from these drugs because of either asymptomatic hypotension or before other interventions are tried. Um, another practical trip that I use in my clinic is if a patient is on diuretic and they're completely compensated and they come to you with either symptomatic or asymptomatic relatively low blood pressure, that one of the first steps would actually be to get rid of the diuretic, which, as we know, is, is probably the, the, the drug that has the least uh, s survival benefit, if any. So let's see if this works here. So this is by way of introduction to the next question. I don't know if you guys are following Jeopardy. But this guy's amazing. This is Thursday night's episode. I'm looking over at Josh, and I see him kind of thinking, I could I lose could, it all here. 6,800, please. You could lose it all. <laughs> but let's take a look and find out. Mark Kurlansky wrote a whole book on the history of this. The only rock we eat. What is, what is, what is salt? That's it. Okay, so what's the deal with sodium? Um, so, um, thank you for laughing. It's Saturday morning. So what is the deal with sodium? So sodium is, you know, the bane of the existence of all of us who look after the patients with heart failure. Um, we uh, speak to patients about their salt intake all the time. Um, and there is lots of rationale uh, for why uh, sodium is bad in heart failure, and you can see that rationale, that, phys uh, that physiologic rationale on the right um, of this slide. But there is some controversial data related to why low sodium diets may actually be bad in heart failure. And as usual, physiology thought experiments go, you, you just start getting a headache when you try to tr uh, ration or rationalize why low or high sodium diets would be better. Take on, take on, add to that the fact that if you actually look at um, empiric data, um, unfortunately, patients who are suffering with advanced heart failure tend to have developed cardiac cachexia. Their appetite tends to disappear. They end up taking in less sodium. So obviously, that confounds the data when you're looking at prognosis and sodium diets. So it's a really big problem. Um, and if you look at the uh, Canadian guidelines, um, they do suggest uh, a 2 to 3 gram uh, sodium diet, a sodium restricted diet. Um, but in the sort of footnotes, they say that the optimum quantity of salts in the diet is still a subject of great debate. Um, and so, you know, for those of us who look after a lot of heart failure patients, we, we know uh, that patients do run into problems if they do sodium splurges. Um, so I have my own strategy of dealing with this that kind of takes these uh, somewhat vague statements from the guidelines and puts it to practical use. Um, I tell my, all my patients to avoid cooking with salt or eating pre-prepared foods. Um, and when shopping for food, stick to the periphery of the grocery store. 
Um, you know, telling patients two grams of sodium, it, it, some patients just ignore it, some patients obsess over it, and, and it, it's sort of self-defeating. But the rationale is that if the patients are on a single dose of diuretic that's not changing from day to day, if there's huge fluctuations in their salt uh, content of their diet, they're going to potentially end up with either volume depletion or congestion. Um, and the best way to get somebody onto a salt-controlled diet is to give some parameters of salt restriction, uh, but not necessarily to make it so that so that there's no salt. And if you thought the data, and, and, and the data for salt restriction is poor, the data for fluid restriction is even worse. Um, and this was a study, this is the only study uh, that was a randomized study, both salt and fluid restriction in hospitalized patients. It's really hard to do these kind of studies in ambulatory patients because no one really knows what they eat. Um, so in, obviously in a controlled environment and, and for a hospitalization, um, it's much more workable. And this is a relatively small study. It was published in JAMA Internal Medicine. Uh, looking at about 75 patients uh, where they uh, did severe uh, salt and fluid restriction in, in half and then the other ones they did usual care. Um, and what they showed was, in fact, there was no difference in their ability to decongest the patients. Uh, what was interesting is, guess what it did show? The patients who were fluid restricted, salt restricted, they just got really thirsty, which I guess is not that surprising. Um, and so these are some visual analog scales of thirst. I was curious, how do they measure this? Um, and they actually have like scales and my thirst uh, bothers me a lot. Uh, my thirst, it just, I started reading these. I am so thirsty I could drink water uncontrollably and like I just get really thirsty when I think about this. Um, <laughs> anyhow, so from a very practical perspective, it's supposed to be a practical talk. Uh, fluid restriction of less than two liters a day is suggested only for patients whose congestion is not easily controlled with diuretics. And I have to tell you, one of the best ways that I align with my patients is when they walk into my clinic and they tell me that my doctor told me I can't drink more than a liter or a liter and a half of fluid a day that from, a hospital, from their hospitalization. I say, don't, don't worry about the fluid. You can drink if you're thirsty. They're so happy. They take their medications. They come back and see me. It's great. Um, obviously, in, pa the, in the rare patients who have uh, significant hyponatremia, then that, 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 then that ch does change things, and then fluid uh, restriction becomes much more important. Is everyone else thirsty? I'm so thirsty now. Um, so activity and exercise, this comes up very frequently in the clinic, and I'm sure your patients are asking the same thing. The doctor told me, my cardiologist told me my heart's failing. I need to, I'm trying to take it easy. I don't want to do anything. In fact, the opposite is probably true. Um, there are lots of physiologic benefits of exercise training in patients with chronic heart failure, and they're all listed here. I won't go through all the details. Um, and there's good data that shows that you can train patients uh, with heart failure to improve their metabolic and their, their ability to consume oxygen and ultimately their aerobic capacity. And that's shown in, in the graph on the right. Um, without going into details, it shows an improvement in, in VO2 max in patients with heart failure who are trained um, in a cardiac rehab. So we do recommend cardiac rehab in all patients, and certainly for, even for patients who don't have access to cardiac rehab, which can sometimes be a problem, uh, we, do rec uh, we do recommend regular activity, increase in your activity and training like, like you would do in any other uh, condition where you want to improve your conditioning. Um, and what's really important um, that you can reassure your patients with is that in all studies evaluating exercise training in patients with heart failure, there's very, there are very few catastrophic events are happening. These people are not dropping dead in their rehab. Um, uh, and so really they don't have to worry about it. From a very practical perspective, I tell my patients that they should limit their, uh, their activity by, by symptoms and common sense. You know, a new diagnosis of heart failure or an EF of 10% probably shouldn't be going swimming by themselves for two hours in a basement apartment, right? Uh, but otherwise, they should be active and they should gradually increase their activity. Um, at the three-month follow-up visit, she's doing relatively well. Uh, she's still functional class three. Uh, she does get some presyncope when she stands up, which is pretty common with the medical therapy. Uh, she's now been titrated up to good, goal-directed medical therapy, as is described on the right. Um, uh, she's still on a little bit of Lasix. Her blood pressure is a bit better, actually, 92 over 50. Her heart rate 62. Her JVP is not high, and her lungs are clear, and there's no swelling, and she's uh, due to see her cardiologist in the next six months. Um, and she tells you that she just went to get her license renewed, which she's allowed to do, uh, but they asked about organ donation, and she started thinking about heart transplant. And she says, how will I know if I need a heart transplant? And you look back at the cardiology consultation, and it says, well, I'll see her back in six months, and contact me should you have any further questions. So what does that mean, and you know, uh, what, what, should I be concerned? Um, and these are some signs that things are not going well, and I think these are important ones for you guys to recognize. You can send them back to the, heart, to the cardiologist. 
uh, frequent hospitalizations, significant functional limitation, which I'll describe in a second, symptomatic hypotension, progressive renal dysfunction, and a high diuretic requirement, all should be quite, worry, quite worrisome. Um, and most importantly, weight loss. So these are patients that look relatively compensated. Um, they come off their diuretic, but they're starting to lose weight, or they're on diuretic, and they're congested, but their, their weight's actually lower than it was. I mean, the reason I'm highlighting this is that weight loss is, is the bane of our existence in the advanced heart failure world because once cardiac cachexia takes in, you're really limited in what you can offer patients in terms of advanced heart failure therapy. So uh, one of the most common reasons for saying a patient's been referred too late is that they've already developed cardiac cachexia. Um, and in terms of symptomatic limitation, what I mean is that they're unable to walk a block without resting um, and they're breathless with doing simple things like dressing or bathing. That should be a concern. Get them back in to see their cardiologist uh, because they may need something else done. So just to summarize, heart, in heart failure, a little medical therapy is good, but more medical therapy is better. Salt and flu restriction is controversial. Avoiding high salt foods and adopting a salt-controlled, salt-stable diet, probably the most useful practical advice. And fluid restriction makes people thirsty, especially talking about fluid restriction. And patients with symptomatic hypotension, progressive renal dysfunction, weight loss, dyspnea, and, and uh, dyspnea when bathing or dressing should be referred back to their cardiologist. And I'll end there. Thank you.